Okay, um, hello everybody. Um, I'm happy to start the first session, uh, New Frontiers in Neuroscience Part 1. We have uh, four speakers in this uh, <coughs> session. The first one is uh, Yossi Ovel from the Zoology Department and Sagol School of Neuroscience. And he's going to talk about from bad behavior to robotic cognition, new frontiers in behavioral sciences. I just want to see that my movie is running. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to talk about behavior today. So uh, everybody wants to study behavior. Okay? This is probably because behavior is the ultimate goal uh, of the brain. Uh, I believe that there is probably not a, s a single uh, proposal submitted today in the field of neuroscience that does not include some suggestion of studying behavioral at some level. Most of us, however, do not study natural behavior. So many people study the uh, formerly behaving brain slice. Uh, many others study the non-behaving anesthetized brain. This is even though we know today that uh, anesthetized brain behaves or functions completely different uh, from a, a, an awake brain. And even though sophisticated methods to study the somewhat behaving brain do not allow the subject to uh, freely move in its natural environment or to freely interact with uh, uh, other individuals. So I don't want to say that, not, that we cannot learn anything using these methods. Obviously, we can learn a lot, and we are learning a lot. But I think that it is time to develop new methodologies, new tools to study uh, natural behavior in its full complexity. So my movie is not running through the presentation, so I'll show you here what I mean. Uh, so this is what we want to study. This is what we try to study in our lab. Many, many mammals flying together, moving together, foraging together, searching for food, interacting with each other, uh, making love, and fighting with each other. OK, so how do we do it? So next, uh, I will try to convince you that, uh, OK, so let me first say that in order to study behavior in its full complexity, uh, you need a good animal model or a good model. And I will try to convince you that bats uh, serve as such models. So bats account for more than 20% of mammalian species. Probably you've all heard me saying this already a few times in the past. But what I want to say today uh, even further is that they are probably the most diverse group within the uh, mammalian order. Okay? So any behavioral um, task you are interested in, you will probably be able to find a, a bat species that is a good model to study this task. So if we think of sensory uh, abilities, for instance, as, as I'm interested in, uh, you have bats that rely on vision, on olfaction, uh, on sonar, on echolocation, on hearing, and even several exotic bats, such as, bats that, uh, such as vampire bats that use IR infrared sensing, or other bats that have been shown to be able to navigate using magnetic sensing. If you're interested in uh, social behavior, you can find a whole range of social behaviors from bats that roost in isolation all alone to bats that live in colonies of many, many millions. Okay, the biggest uh, mammalian uh, colonies after humans are bat colonies. If you're interested in navigation or in movement, you can study bats that navigate over thousands of kilometers. Uh, cognitive mats have been shown in bats. So basically, everything you look for, you can find uh, in bats. Okay, so bats are interesting, but that's not enough uh, for, for, to, to generate a good uh, animal model. Um, what I think makes them very unique and advantageous to study uh, behavior is their unique active sensory system uh, their system of echolocation or biosonar. So you probably all know that bats emit sound in order to perceive the environment. This is what you see in this movie here. This bat is shouting in high frequencies. The sound waves move through the environment. They imping or hit different objects in the environment, uh, return to the bat's brain. The bat receives two echoes, one in each ear, and its brain has to somehow translate this incoming sensory information into this uh, image of the world. So. In my lab, we're very much interested in sonar, and we study sonar a lot, but today I don't want to study sonar. I, I don't want to talk about studying sonar. I just want to emphasize that because bats emit sound in order to perceive their environment, this gives me, as a scientist, a huge, a huge, a huge advantage, sorry, because I can uh, only record them. I, all I need to do is to put a microphone to record the bat, and I can infer a lot about its uh, behavior. So what do I mean? So here's one example how I use uh, ultrasonic recordings in, on, in order to tap into the bat's sensory uh, reception of the world. 
So when you have your rat moving through an arena or, or the monkey or even your human or whatever, uh, you're, you're dying to know what sensor information is coming into the brain of this uh, subject, right? What is it attending? When did it notice that we put uh, a new object in the room? Is it uh, now looking or sensing or whisking or whatever uh, another individual? And of course, uh, how much sensory information did it collect before making a decision? So we can do all of this just by putting a microphone or a few microphones, a few, a few microphones in this case, in the room. So what you will see here on the right side is a bat that was uh, trained to, uh, this is slowed down, it was trained to, to land on an object in a completely dark room. The object is over here. And what you see here is the data we can get using an array of microphones spread, spread all around the room. Okay, so this is the target the bat is uh, heading towards. The blue line depicts the trajectory of the bat. And each of these black lines is one sensory input. Okay, it is one signal emitted by the bat uh, so I know exactly when the bat is collecting information about its target. And moreover, I can say something, or not something, I can accurately say where this bat is directing its information to. Okay, this is one bat beam, a second bat beam. So let's, let, let's look at this uh, movie once again. Uh, the bat is now starting to fly. It has probably now detected the target because we see that it's starting to turn its sensory acquisition and movement towards the target. By now it has acquired three bits of information about the target. Here's the fourth one, here's the fifth one and so forth. So when this bat landed, by the time it landed, and this is a very simple uh, cognitive task, uh, I can tell you exactly how much information did this bat acquire uh, in order to, to perform its task. Okay, so what can we do with uh, such, rich, such a rich description of, uh, of behavior? So one thing that we uh, recently uh, were doing is to try to answer something that puzzled me since I, I've seen this behavior for the first time, and this is why do bats fly in these curved trajectories, okay? Why doesn't the bat just fly directly to the target? This seems really inefficient, right, to do this curved uh, trajectory. So uh, here's another example. This is a snapshot, okay? Here is the bat. This is where it's starting its flight, and this is the target. Once again, the black dash line uh, shows the, the uh, trajectory of the bat, and you can see that the bat is doing this very indirect, highly curved trajectory instead of flying straight to the target. And this uh, uh, puzzled us. And uh, in order to try to model this, uh, we used a theory from the uh, field of control theory. So control theory is a field of engineering that usually is used to guide uh, missiles or airplanes or other moving objects based on sensory input. Okay, so uh, when we move through the environment, we're constantly collecting sensory uh, information. This is noisy information, of course. And we somehow have to translate this sensory information into motor commands, into movement, right, into action. And it is currently unknown how the brain uh, does this. So this is what we try to model. So I'm not going to the mathematical details of the model, but I'll try to give you uh, some intuition. So all our model knows is that the bat starts over here, and this is its in initial velocity, okay? And of course that the target is over here. Now what the model or the bat needs to do is to decrease this angle, okay? We call this angle theta. It's the angle between the target and the flight uh, direction or flight trajectory of the bat. And once the bat will decrease this angle to zero, this means that the bat is now flying towards the target, which is its goal. Okay, so you can use different strategies to uh, decrease theta or to correct this error, right? Correct this angular error. And the first uh, approach we, uh, we used was, uh, is what is called in the control theory a proportional controller. Okay, and what this controller does, I, and, and of course I know exactly when the bat acquires sensor information, right? These are these dots over here. So at each, uh, at each sensory update, my bat estimates the angle theta, and then if it is using a proportional controller, it decreases the angle uh, proportionally. Okay, so let's say the proportional gain is, is 10%, and let's say that the original error is 30 degrees, so after one sensory in, uh, update, the bat will now go decrease the angle to 27. Right, next step, 10% uh, of 27, 2.7 degrees, and so on and so forth. So if my bat was doing something like this, I would expect to see uh, this red curvature, okay? And obviously this is not the bat is doing. So you see it is converging to the target, but completely differently uh, from what my bat is doing. So next we tested a bit more uh, complex control, uh, uh, controller, still a very simple, very commonly used uh, controller, which is called uh, the proportional derivative controller. So this controller, in addition to taking into account the proportion, it also looks at the derivative. Okay, so let's look at the example. Let's take the same example I just told you. The original angle was 30. Now I close my angle by 3 degrees to 27. So the derivative is 30 minus 27, right? It is 3 degrees. Okay, and basically what this controller does is it balances the movement or the maneuvering 
uh, based on the derivative. So if the derivative is too high, this means that I'm turning too strong, and I will probably uh, end up doing something like this. You see, this bat is turning too strong. It's strong, turning here very strongly and turning here and here again. And what the derivative term, term does is to balance my uh, turning, and this ends up in a, in a smooth curvature. And as you can see, it uh, reconstructs the uh, flight path, the actual flat pa flight path of my bat, uh, better than we uh, ever expected. Now, this controller uh, even predicted highly, uh, I would say, crazy maneuvers, such as this one. The bat here takes off from this point, and instead of uh, flying straight towards the target, it performs a 360 degree, uh, 360 degree sorry, turn, a uh, very, very unclear maneuver, but look, my model predicts that this is exactly what uh, the bat will do. Okay, so interestingly, uh, this model predicts now that the brain of the bat, and I, I assume other, at least fast-moving uh, animals, also must uh, calculate, estimate the derivative of their error when they are moving. Uh, but this still doesn't answer the question I started with. Okay, I started with the question, why doesn't my bat fly straight? Why does it fly in this curved uh, trajectory? And there could be uh, two hypotheses, at least. One is that it has some motor limits. Okay? It cannot exert strong forces, sufficiently strong to turn. Uh, the other would be a sensory limit. Okay? And this is a, perhaps a more interesting uh, hypothesis. So this is what we wanted to check. So what we wanted to do next is to reduce sensory noise. Okay? How do I reduce sensory noise uh, for a bat? Surprisingly, perhaps to some of you, what I need to do is to turn on the light. These experiments were done in the dark. Bats are really good in measuring distance in the dark, but they use vision. And of course, that when I'm talking about um, azimuth resolution, right, my ability to measure angle, vision is superb to echolocation, even in bats. So that's what we did next. We turned on the light. And as we hoped or, or expected, uh, the flight trajectories in light were uh, much more direct than those we've seen in the dark. So here you see one example. Uh, the dashed line is the bat, and you see how the bat turns strongly towards the target, and here is another example. And the green line is the prediction of my model, the same model when I just reduce the sensory noise. Okay, so by sensory noise, I mean that I can measure uh, the angle more accurately, basically. Okay, now interestingly, if you take the same model and say what would happen if the bat would fly from here to here in the dark, you get this blue curved trajectory. Okay, so what this suggests, and I think it's interesting conceptually, is that the bat can exert stronger forces. Okay, it can maneuver more strongly, it can fly more directly, but sensory noise is what is uh, actually limiting it. Okay, so, so this was uh, one example, but uh, uh, this was still all in the, in the lab, right, with a somewhat behaving brain. And what I uh, said at the beginning is that we, we really want to take this into the field. Okay, what we want to do is, is what I call neuroecology, to study natural behaving animals in the field, to combine the fields of neuroscience and the field of ecology, which in my opinion are two sides of the same coin, which currently are not speaking to each other uh, at all. So how do we do this? So in the, in the past three years uh, in our lab, what we've been trying to do is to develop miniature sensors that can be uh, mounted on the bats in order to study them in their completely natural environment. So what you see here is probably the smallest GPS in the world, weighs less than three grams, and connected to it, you see a microphone, okay? So this allows us to record the uh, sensory system or the active sensory system or the echolocation system of the bat. And you see it here on a fruit bat here in Israel, and this is a bat called Rhinopoma microphyllum. It's a 30 gram animal, a very small animal, and I will now show you data collected from this bat. So here's the movement, okay? So this bat flies in northern Israel. For those of you who don't know, this is the Lake of Galilee. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked on this water, and today bats are flying above it. And what you see here is, uh, in blue, is the uh, trajectory of one night of uh, a female from this species. And, you know, most of us study behavior in arenas of, you know, 10 meters by 10 meters is con considered huge, right? This bat is flying uh, cumulatively over 100 kilometers per night, okay? And my arena is 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. And in blue, you see one uh, uh, night. In green, you see the second night. Some of it, some of it is cut up here. Uh, but this is... This is just movement, okay? Many people track animals and they can say a lot about their movement. Again, it's very, very interesting, but uh, we want to do more than that. So once again, we use our, uh, our advantage that these bats are emitting sound in order to receive their environment, in order to infer the behavior of the bat. And, and think of a rat or a monkey or any other animal moving in this scale, and how would you be able to, to say anything about the behavior of this, uh, uh, or a human, right? With humans, it's maybe possible, but unethical. Um, so uh, here you see recordings. 
on board the bat. Okay, these are recordings of my microphone. This is called a spectrogram. It's a way to present audio. Uh, what you see is time on the x-axis, frequency on the, a on the y-axis, and each of these blobs here is one echolocation call. It's like those black lines that I've shown you before in the movie. And what you see here, and this, uh, and this was recorded somewhere along this trajectory, and what you see here is what we call a feeding buzz. Okay? It's a very typical sequence of calls. You see the calls are becoming shorter. The intervals be between them are becoming shorter. And this is what we call a feeding buzz, and it is emitted by bats that are attacking prey. It's very, very typical for bats attacking prey. You know, the sensory logics behind it is clear. You want to update sensory information more often. So wherever one of my bats emits one of these sequences, I can put a brown flag which depicts attacking prey. Now notice, this will be important for the uh, future, that uh, when one bat attacks prey, other bats know this, right? Some people call this the Bamba effect, right? We're sitting in a, in a theater, in a black, in a completely dark room, and somebody opens a, a package of chips, and everybody immediately knows where this somebody is, okay? So it's the same with bats, but they have to do this, right? They cannot open the bag silently because they need this for sensory perception. Uh, the second recording, which you see down here, is a, an example of how do I know when my blat, bat is interacting with uh, uh, other bats, what we call conspecifics in ecology, okay, individuals from the same species. And uh, what you see here are calls of my tagged bat, the bat that is carrying the GPS, these very loud calls. And with red circles, I circled uh, the other bat. So all bats are echolocating, right? So whenever another bat comes near, I know it is there. Uh, and I can then try to analyze the interactions between the two. So I will give you now, again, just a taste of what we can do with such rich uh, behavioral data. So one key question in, uh, in behavioral ecology is uh, why do animals uh, group when they forage? Okay, forage is a word in ecology that means uh, searching for food or feeding. Uh, and, and often you see many animals from the same species feeding together, right? And a fundamental question is whether uh, they gain something from this group foraging or, well, I mean, whether it is beneficial for them or uh, perhaps they just all accumulate to where or all aggregate to where the food is and they're just competing with each other. Okay, so this is uh, something we try to uh, address with our data. Uh, what you see here is the distance, the distribution of the distance from the closest bat. Okay, so this is the distance from the closest bat, and this is uh, the proportion of time each individual spends at each distance. And what you see, the blue curve is the real data, and what you see is our bats spend a lot of time near other bats. So 40% of the time, you could see it also here, by the way, I didn't mention it. Look how many uh, conspecifics, how many other bats from the same species, all of these turquoise flags, uh, I, our bat encounters during the night. Okay, so it, so it spends a huge proportion of its time nearby other individuals. Uh, and if you would take a random model, just let the bats move independently without attraction, without any sort of uh, force that causes aggregation, you would get this black distribution. Okay, so it seems uh, that the bats are definitely aggregating. Okay, they're attracted to other uh, individual bats. However, now I can use my data about foraging, about attacks, to say whether uh, when density, the density of the bat is high, whether this impairs the bat. Okay, so what you see here is the number of attacks, or actually the percent of attacks, as a function of the density of bats. Okay, the numbers here don't really matter, but the more I go to the right, the more bats, the bats are dense. And you see very clearly that bats are impaired by conspecific uh, interference. Okay, uh, so when there are more bats around, I am much, more, much less probable to attack uh, prey. So what we believe is going on uh, is actually what I call a social foraging trade-off. Okay? On the one hand, bats gain from flying together. And this is due to this Bamba effect that I described earlier, right? If I, ah, sorry, I need to say one more thing. Uh, echolocation is very limited in its range, okay? A bat can detect uh, a prey. They're looking for, these bats are searching for tiny insects, okay? So a bat can detect a prey from something like 10 meters. You see this uh, black uh, volume over here. So I'm very much limited in my range of detection. I can hear another bat, on the other hand, from a much, much, much longer distance, a uh, larger distance, okay? So we estimate the distance from which I can uh, detect a conspecific to be something like 160 meters, this gray volume over here. So what we believe is that by flying near each other, okay, so imagine this situation. I have patches of insects, these uh, uh, curvatures, these uh, contours over here, and my bats are flying and trying to maintain uh, dis close distances to each other. And now this bat, for instance, uh, detects an insect, the whole swarm of bats will now be driven towards this uh, patch. Okay, so that's the benefit of flying in a group. Uh, however, uh, we were able to show, and I will not show you the data, that when the density of bats uh, becomes uh, too high, the bats starts, start to attend other conspecifics all the time. So they start pointing, and you can really see it with the echolocation. They're pointing their sonar towards other bats instead of probably searching for prey. 
So, you know, it's as if you're driving on the highway and I tell you, follow this red car, and at one case you're doing it and there's nobody on the highway, and in the other case there are a lot of cars around you and you need to constantly attend the other car, cars while uh, following this car. So I think that's what's going on. And when you model the system, this is the model of the system, uh, you get exactly this. So what you see here is the time to catch prey, so lower is better, and you see, and this is the bad density, and you see that if you only look at the uh, benefit of flying in a group, you get this uh, blue curve, right? You become, become more efficient when there are more bats. If you only look at social interference, you get this red group, uh, red curve, sorry. You, there, there are, the more bats around, the more competition, the more sensory interference, the less uh, efficient you are. And if you combine the two, you get some optimum. And interestingly, this optimum is more or less where, uh, what we estimate to be the uh, distribution, the density of bats uh, in northern Israel of this species. Okay, so where are we going next? Uh, of course, we want to uh, extend this approach to more sensors. Uh, we have newer sensors today, sensors that include cameras that can be put on the bats, uh, accelerometers that allow you to, for instance, uh, monitor the attacks of the bats, and uh, hopefully also uh, EEG, so we actually we can record any analog signal, uh, heartbeat, uh, temperature, body temperature, whatever, uh, but hopefully one day we'll also be able to record uh, brain activity of bats while they are flying somewhere above the Lake of Galilee, 400 meters high, dozens of kilometers. <coughs> <clears throat> Finally, working in the field is noisy, but sometimes the noise is actually interesting. So I don't know if you've ever thought of, uh, you know, when you get your animals and you're doing the experiment, uh, how their origin influences their behavior. So we, <clears throat> we haven't thought of this at all until we saw uh, this. So a few years ago, uh, Nahum Ulanovsky and Asaf Tsoal described this very stereotypical behavior of fruit bats. Okay? What you see here is a fruit bat leaving its cave, flying to a tree, something like 25 kilometers. Every color here depicts a different night. And you see a very, very boring animal, right? Flying to a tree, eating, flying back, flying to a tree, eating, flying back. Uh, so we thought, okay, we live in Tel Aviv. Let's do the same with, uh, we wanted to track bats. Let's track bats in Tel Aviv, right? It's easier. Why should I go to Jerusalem? And uh, what we, this is what we did, and this is what you see down here. We put uh, GPS tags on uh, bats that roost uh, something like 10 minutes from here in Elzelia. And what we saw is a completely different behavior. Okay? Each night, again, is depicted by a, a different color. And you see that uh, this bat, one night it flies to the seaport of Elzelia, another night it flies to this neighborhood, then it flies to Tel Aviv University. So the same species, completely def different behavior. Okay? Um, so, you know, if you want, this is the, the country bat flying to the same bar night after night, very boring bat, versus the city bat that is bar hopping, right? Every night it goes somewhere else. Uh, but of course, so this is really preliminary, preliminary. I cannot say much about it, but of course, it's very intriguing. Uh, you know, think about uh, adaptations of the brain. Maybe, maybe not because it's, uh, it's too short in time, but you know, all, you all know the story about taxi drivers in London. Uh, think about other cognitive abilities that might be influenced by this behavior. So something we, we uh, are very much interested in uh, studying. And finally, my title promised robotics. And during preparation of the talk, I said it's much more important to talk about behavior. Uh, but for those of you who came just to hear about robotics, I will say a few words. Um, of course, if you think of applications, uh, then one of the most applicative aspects in, in our lab is to apply what we learn from bats to robots. Here you see a, a robot with bat ears and, and a, 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 a mouse-like emitter. And the idea is to try to um, harvest our knowledge about how bats move, how they search, how they interact, how they uh, uh, um, operate their sonar system in order to develop a, a better navigation system for robotics. For instance, uh, for instance imagine you're a, a vacuum cleaning robot. Right, which today is a complete imbecile. It's just moving through, uh, through your apartment without any knowledge about the environment. Uh, imagine that it could, for instance, map the environment and, uh, and, and perhaps do something a smarter or a more uh, efficient search. And here, I must say, most of this work, I must say something in favor of the Sagol School of Neuroscience. So most of this work uh, is done in, in strong collaboration with the School of Engineering, especially with Gabor Kosha from the School of uh, Mechanical Engineering. Uh, now, I'm a physicist. And physicists are very suspicious about engineering. Uh, actually, I never went into the School of Engineering uh, before the uh, Sagol School of Neuroscience was established. Uh, and, and engineers are probably also very suspicious about physicists, I must say, to be politically correct. Uh, but since then, uh, and since this school is, is, uh, is uh, encouraging collaboration um, so strongly, 
Uh, we're, I'm, today, I'm working a lot uh, with people in the School of Engineering, and actually, I have five master students that are co-supervised by me, and by, uh, or they are supervised by uh, faculty members in the School of, of Engineering and co-supervised uh, by me. Uh, finally, thanks. I need to thank a lot of students that collected all of this data. I want to mention two collaborators uh, that donated uh, a lot of their time to two of the works I've shown, Nacho Mulanovsky, of course, from Weizmann University, and Nadi uh, Bau from Norway, who did all of the control theory modeling. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. I don't know, do we have time for questions? Who's there? Yeah? Do you have any questions? Wow, perfect question. I couldn't have asked for a better question. Uh, so bats are very unique in this, uh, in this sense. Uh, bats live much longer than uh, mammals of, from the same size, of the same size. So a bat that is smaller than a rat, you know, a rat will live four years, maybe, max. Uh, these bats can live up to 40 years. Uh, I think the question of aging is, uh, you know, if you're looking for an animal model, this is a perfect animal model. Only today I know a few, a few people who are starting to get interested uh, in this. Uh, one of the, so we really want to conduct long-term experiments. I didn't tell you about this, but we're trying to establish a colony of bats in our facility that will be free to fly and come back whenever they want. And hopefully we'll be able to look also at the effects of aging. Maybe in four, you can ask me in 40 years and I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you more. But those animals were more or less the same age? Uh, you mean the, the city versus country? Yeah. Bats? Or, or in general, you're asking? It's very hard to say. So we, we can tell juveniles up to two years, but then it's uh, anywhere, anywhere between two and 40. Uh, I, I can tell the sex, though. <laughs> Any other questions? Todd, so study behavior.